very much, Anita. Um, our last speaker is uh, Sorry, only 10 years old. They're already, they're already a veteran activist, having started at the age of 16. Elijah has been at the forefront of young people who are trying to create positive change in society in the face of familial, societal, and institutional resistance. They are a soci sociology undergraduate who will be speaking about their perspective and experiences as a student. Um, please take it away, Elijah. All right. Thank you. All right, so that's me. I'm Elijah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me in the space. Thanks for sharing. And thanks for listening and being here today. Um, I use they them pronouns. I know that's something that can be quite unfamiliar with people. Does anyone need clarifications on what that means? No? All right, then I'll carry on. All right, so. Um, there are various hats that I wear, right? Like, as I'm not just a youth, but I'm a youth who has undergone like the MOE educational system. Um, I'm queer. Uh, I am. I've been an activist for a while, and currently I'm a sociology undergraduate at NTU. So there are various experiences and identities that I hold that have shaped um, how my mental health has been affected and how I perceive like the importance of addressing mental health issues in Singapore as well. Yeah, uh, can move on. All right, so um, as a sociology undergraduate, right, I think it's important to set premises and understand like social forces and social structures. I think, um, I, I say this with no value judgment. We live in a capitalist society. We live in a capitalist world. Um, how it's defined is an economic system based on market competition and a pursuit of profit in which the means of production or capital are privately owned by individuals or corporations. So I want to zoom into two words that are highlighted um, or rather like bolded in the definition, right? Competition and profit. I think that in, uh, or rather in another understanding of profit that we can use in how we understand the issues that we face uh, personally today, right? Uh, what are the goals that we are expected to achieve? What are we expected to gain? As students, we are often expected to get like good grades, we have to do well in school. And right now, not just in our studies, but also like you have to win medals in like uh, your basketball match, in your taekwondo matches, you have to get gold in SYF for your performing arts, uh, you have to do well in your uniform groups and whatnot. There are so many stresses that students face. Uh, and like, I don't know if it's clear, I personally haven't use a pressure cooker that looks like this because of the era that I'm born in. But um, yeah, I think, I think we live in a pressure cooker, right? Like we are faced with so many stresses. Students not only have to think about our studies and our holistic commitments, uh, but for students who hold uh, marginalized identities as well, like for myself as a queer person, there are various struggles that come with that as well. Um, students from um, the working class, they might have to stress about taking care of their younger siblings, uh, working part-time, uh, as uh, Auntie, or rather Dr. Jordan has talked about <laughs> earlier as well. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so I think what's important to understand, I can't, I will end up giving like a three-hour lecture if I go into how like capitalism exactly links to like mental health issues, but I would suggest like, if you have the time, read about class conflict. I think that really sets the premise to like different, um, social context in different uh, areas of oppression or like the basis of oppression that people face, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, uh, moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so stress. I think this is something that we all face, right? Not just students, but there's work stress as well. There are stresses that come with various household responsibilities. How do I look at, uh, take care of my children? How do I take care of my elderly parents? Uh, these are the stresses that I hear from my mom quite a bit also, right? Having to be in the sandwich generation and having to consider the well-being and the, yeah, the, the lives of um, the, the, the generations that they are sandwiched in between. Um, for me, one of my biggest stresses is my studies as someone who goes to school and is expected to get good grades. Uh, but I think the position that I've had growing up is a bit different from what I've heard of the experiences of my peers. I don't say that their parents would stress them out. Uh, they are expected to get no less than an A grade. They have to be top in class and whatnot. Uh, I didn't have that. I think I'm grateful to have parents who 
um, didn't put too much pressure on academics. But even then, right, like I was still keenly aware of the position I'm in as like the eldest cousin, the eldest like sibling, and I placed that expectation on myself to do well in school. I remember in primary school, I would always cry before every paper that I took. Uh, although my parents weren't the ones like stressing me out, but I understood that like this was the expectations that society and people do have on me. So yeah, I can only imagine what more like how much more exponential the stress could have been experienced by youths who received the direct, you know, like comments of like, you know, you better do well in school or like you're not gonna have lunch today, or you gotta do well in school, I'm gonna cut your allowance, that kind of thing. So yeah, these, these academic pressures and now also um, yeah, doing performing well in CCA as well um, are stresses that really affect students in school. And I think like some uh, statistics that have already been brought up earlier, you know, one in three young people has mental health symptoms and uh, yeah, you click on that. Yeah, and like the study that talked about how um, yeah, mental illness is the largest contributor to years of uh, years lost to disease for 10 to 34 year olds and it's also the second largest across all age groups and uh, Parkson also mentioned earlier about how there are like we have the highest suicide rates on records last year uh, since the year 2000 and that's 112 cases last year uh, between people aged 10 to 29 and these are not just the statistics these are not just statistics these are actual lives that are being lost uh, due to various um, mental health conditions that they might have had, or they rather they had, uh, that led them to uh, to a death by suicide. So, as, aside from studies, there are work stressors also. Um, for youths who are juggling, you know, part-time work and school, there is that compounded layer of stress, right? Not only having to think about like how do I hit the GPA that I need, how do I get the grades that I need, but also like how do I earn enough so that I can pay for transport, so that I can uh, have meals in between my classes. Um, and this, this affects people who, are, um, who, who require more financial assistance as well. Uh, I have friends who don't come from very wealthy backgrounds, uh, they have to take care of their younger siblings, so it's unpaid labour and also paid labour, right? Part-time work and also caregiving in their yeah. homes. And these are the compounded stresses that affect students, youths who are expected to take on the responsibilities uh, that they shouldn't have to, you know, youths should grow up happy, uh, you know, um, not saying not have a care in the world, but not have to care about things that uh, shouldn't be within their control or rather are not within their control, right? There are family situations and whatnot. So, um, yeah, there are students who work to make ends meet for themselves. Uh, for myself, I'm holding multiple jobs as I study as well. I'm writing, I'm transcribing, I'm tutoring. And I, I have to admit that a part of it is because I want a bit more allowance so that I can have like a social life with my friends, right? Like going for like um, exhibitions or like supporting my friends, small businesses, that kind of things. Uh, but also some of my friends, um, it's quite ironic the situation actually because they, they are working so that they can pay for their therapy or so they can pay for like mental health diagnosis, which, which it stresses, it effect, affects their mental health as well. So I've had friends who wanted to get like, um, or, or rather they have gotten like their uh, ADHD and like autism diagnosis, but it costs a lot uh, if they don't want to be subject to the very long waiting period of public hospitals. So, um, and they can't receive that financial support from their parents because their parents don't believe in like mental health. So they end up having to pay the hundreds on their own as they're studying and that also adds to the stress that uh, they face, right? And for myself as a transgender person, I'm thinking of like, you know, like surgery and like um, hormone replacement therapy and things like that. And those cost a lot of money. And this, these are the monies that like I, pretty sure I won't get from my parents, at least like 100%. So, yeah, so these are the stresses that I have to juggle as well, like as someone who's working and studying at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and I think, all right, yeah, next. So the social aspect of stress also, I think it's important to address, like especially amongst youths today. Uh, you know, we've talked about how like youths today are very like passionate, uh, we're very angry about various social issues as well. Uh, and I think that also comes to play into the stresses that we experience and we face 
uh, I'll talk about it more from a personal aspect rather than like uh, before going into the broader like social injustices and the climate crisis and whatnot. Uh, but I, as I was, uh, I'm studying sociology now. I wrote a paper for one of my assignments uh, the two semesters ago, uh, and I talked about like how um, transgender people in Singapore. Uh, or transgender youth in Singapore are disproportionately affected in terms of their mental health. And I found this study. Uh, can you click on that? Yeah. All right. So I found this study. Uh, it's called Prejudice, Social Stress, and Mental Health in Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Populations, Conceptual Issues, and Research Evidence. So um, in this study, uh, Mayer talks about how um, stigma, prejudice, and discrimination create a hostile and stressful social environment that causes mental health problems. So there is a correlation between the prejudices you face, the discrimination, the marginalization you face, uh, as people who hold various marginalized identities, right? I'm pretty sure uh, there are stresses that racial minorities in Singapore face. There are stresses that people with disabilities face. There are stresses that LGBTQ plus people face as well. So um, tying into a uh, local statistic, right, so that we can kind of like conceptualize this idea uh, Transgender Singapore uh, did a survey uh, quite recently, I think around 2018 or 2017, and they found that 77.6% of trans people were bullied, uh, abused, or ostracized. So this is a very significant statistic, right, of transgender people who are affected as a result of discrimination, as a result of prejudice, or simply a lack of awareness towards uh, the validity of trans identities, and they face hate for that. And that affects their mental health as well, and alongside various other aspects of their lives, right? And um, also with the recent uh, incident at Hua Chong, where the counselor shared um, very absurd statistics about intestinal worms <laughs> and uh, STDs uh, in relation to the queer community um, during one of the school presentations for the secondary four um, students. Uh, I, I could imagine that that would have been very distressing for the queer students who were in the audience or who have heard about the incident as well. Like imagine being in a school where you are supposed to be taken care of by the adults, right? The adults, you, are, you entrust um, your safety and your education to these adults who then talk about how, oh, you know, because you hold this identity, um, you, you are messed up in all sorts of ways, you are susceptible to judgments in all sorts of ways. And um, I, I can speak to my own experience as well, um, because when I was in secondary four, uh, I, I don't think I looked too different from how I look now, I, maybe a bit longer hair. Uh, I, I was in a lecture theatre, right, like three quarters of the cohort were there, and uh, before the lecture started, the, the lecturer in front, uh, they had a mic and they were speaking to me through the mic and they said, um, as long as you're wearing a skirt, I'll take that you're a girl. If you want to be a guy, wait for your next life. And I thought, well, that's such an absurd and like transphobic statement to make and it just came out of nowhere. And I was really affected by it, especially because she was a teacher that I looked up to. Um, she, she had taught classes to me before, but I never thought that she would be capable of making statements like that. And because that trust was eroded in the teaching staff in the school system, I didn't escalate this issue. I didn't know where to look for resources that could help me to deal with like discrimination and how that affected uh, my mental health afterwards. Um, when, when I eventually did like raise the issue to the vice principal though, like before I left the school, uh, he just said, oh, uh, that's not discrimination. You shouldn't feel too hurt. So like a lot of like gas lighting as well. So uh, a conversation I thought would come to solve some problems ended up causing me even more distress, especially approaching my A levels that year. So um, yeah, there there are a lot of like compounded stresses that I think especially um, people who hold minority statuses um, experience as well. On top of the existing stress that like all youths already have to face with their studies and with their co-curriculars, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, can't, I can't speak on behalf of like racial minorities, right? but I would urge like um, audience members here or online to check out um, Instagram accounts like Minority Vices and SG Brown Queers, who do share these incidents uh, of um, racism that they face and how that affects them personally as well. Yeah, okay. All right. 
Here you click one more time. All right, yeah, so another aspect of social stress uh, would be the social, like the awareness of the social injustices and the current climate crisis, right? So um, I feel like from a lot of conversations I've had in like the younger queers, uh, younger circles, um, is that uh, they talk about how like you know like everyone's very like eloquent or aware of like yeah homophobia exists. You know there are laws like three seven seven eight. There are like. Um, you know, there's um, POFMA, FICA, and there are various like structures in place that limit people's freedom of speech, that limit people's ability to even imagine how they can be more involved in tackling the social issues that they are already aware of. So there's, I sense like a very great sense of like helplessness amongst youths as well, in terms of like, yeah, like discrimination that's messed up, racism that's messed up, but like, what do I do about it? You know, there's no like clear direction that they know how to head towards. So I think that also like plays into the stresses that um, you face as well. Like, okay, so much, so much is wrong in the world, but I don't know what to do. And I don't know what, where did, to channel this energy of like confusion and helplessness and um, frustration, anger. And these, these are all valid emotions that they are feeling, but like there's no, there's no out for them, especially with the um, like restrictions that are imposed on civil society participation, right? Like, um, I mean, like for myself as well, I was involved in the MOE protest last year, calling out against transphobia. And by standing there holding really pretty flags and, um, and colorful like vanguard sheets that we would otherwise have used for like school projects and whatnot, uh, we were arrested and given conditional warnings, or, like stern warnings. And that, that plays into how limited uh, we have of like physical spaces to express our thoughts or concerns or like, you know, very like valid, critical um, analysis of the world and society that we live in. We don't have that space. Yeah. And even online as well, like, you know, as, as mentioned earlier, like we have POFMA, we have FICA. So who, who decides what is fake news? Who decides what is allowed to exist on the internet and have legitimacy? So I think these are the, you know, aspects in which they really affect like youths as well, who have a keen interest and desire to want to right the wrongs of the world, but don't have an outlet for that. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of strong opinions as Auntie Gerardine Gener uh, mentioned earlier. <laughs> you know, She's you embracing it now. Yes. <laughs> we have very strong opinions and we don't know what to do with them because we know that if we say something, uh, we might be affected, right? And, uh, or otherwise our loved ones might be affected. Because um, even, even to my own experience, like my parents had to bail me out after the arrest and they were very worried, very right, like validly so, right? Like their parents and their 19-year-old kid just got brought into prison, like, um, like, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and that like stress like ripples to not, not just, it's not like contained within the youth, but also like it ripples to like those who care for the youth, right? Like, uh, I know my mom was very stressed out, having to answer to relatives who were like texting her. I mean, a bit out of concern, but like, you know, having to respond to um, various people who were concerned about my, yeah, how I was after the arrest and whatnot as well. And having to deal with like um, negative, possibly negative reactions that also came from um, people who we love and care about. So there are like these various aspects of stresses that participating in civil society or not knowing how to participate in civil society calls to youth as well, on top of our, uh, you know, academic like responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, schoolwork and uh, paid and unpaid work as well. Yeah. So that's, that's a picture of me from <laughs> the MOE from this. You have five minutes. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay and, and one aspect of like mental health that I want to touch on, which is a bit more personal, uh, gender dysphoria. I'm a transgender person. I experience gender dysphoria, which describes a sense of unease that a person may have because of a mismatch because of eh, between their biological sex and their gender identity. Yeah, it's okay, you can click. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is a picture of me when I was in school. Um, I didn't, I wasn't always able to wear my pants in school. Or actually, I wasn't able to wear my pants in school. I just wore it because I wanted to. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, so I had to wear the skirt to school every other day and that caused me a lot of um, distress, discomfort, uh, didn't feel right to me, but I didn't have a choice because that was the school rules. It was either I wear the skirt or I got sent home and I couldn't study, you know. So, um, so 
gender dysphoria can lead to uh, depression and anxiety and have harmful impact on daily life. Um, various aspects of the more the more social aspects of gender dysphoria will be misgendering and dead naming, uh, such as like being referred to as the wrong gender, right? Like if people use pronouns like she, her, or like he, him on me, uh, that could contribute to my gender dysphoria as someone who uses they them pronouns. And dead naming, if people knew what like my birth name was, which I currently don't use and feel a lot of dysphoria with, because it's a more feminine name, then that affects me as well. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so like uniform rules, hair rules, I think these were aspects of my time in uh, MOE institutions that made me feel very gender dysphoric. And I felt like the rules were a bit like, eh, like it didn't really make sense to me because uh, I, I remember being in, uh, I, I was in council, so I was in front of like the entire school most of the time. And uh, I was always there with another guy. And we had the exact same haircut. But every single time after assembly ended, or like before assembly started, I would be the one getting called out for my hair. Like a teacher would just walk up to me and be like, your hair is inappropriate. Are you sure you can take your like exams with like this haircut? And in my head, I'm like, do you see the guy like right there with the exact same haircut and you're not saying anything? Yeah, so I just found it like a bit absurd, especially since like, how is my hair gonna like affect my studies, right? And yeah, instead of like supporting me, as uh, an already like marginalized person in school, you're compounding to like the stresses that I have to face. Yeah, because of rules that weren't even stated in like the um, like the student like rule book. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to quickly summarize uh, the aspects that I've talked about, um, there are various like mental health concerns uh, that I feel like uh, you face as someone who is still a youth. I think. As a 20 year old, yeah, so studies with competition and pressure, uh, work, uh, be it uh, work that they have to do right now or stresses about employment in the future, and paid and unpaid labor, uh, whether they are working in the aspect of like having to earn money or to take care of their loved ones, and also various societal issues, whether they face discrimination themselves or they understand discrimination and the different social injustices and climate and the climate crisis. Yeah. Yeah, so, so how, you know, got all these issues, um, uh, I don't think, unless like any minister is listening to this right now, I don't think my solutions go to any particular person or group of people in the audience right now, but I think there needs to be more accessible mental health resources, right? Like, uh, when, when I was in school, uh, I've heard a lot of stories about how when uh, students went to their school counsellor, uh, and they came out to them as um, gay or bisexual or any other identities they might hold as a queer person. Uh, they would immediately call the parents and inform them. So in other words, they would out the student to the parents. And that creates a very distressing environment for uh, LGBTQ plus students, right? Like, I come to you, like the counsellor, to talk about the issues that I have. And then you give me more issues by involving my like, parents uh, and telling them something that I'm not ready for them to hear yet. Yeah, so there, there needs to be more accessible mental health resources that does cater to um, people who hold these diverse identities as well. And I think how we interact in school, you know, how we are socialized in schools, I think um, also comes from the education that we receive, right? And how do we treat one another in a way that we respect them as like decent human beings? I think we have, we have classes like character and citizenship education, we have sexuality education, but I can say very honestly, I don't remember anything from these classes that I took. The only thing I remember was that um, in, in one sexuality education class, they handed us a table, uh, and in each column, there were three columns, right? And each, in each column, they wrote um, homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual. And then the whole lesson was just one teacher in front telling her life story and then saying, uh, and then basically saying, okay, so basically everyone is straight and like those other two are phases. And I was like, I literally just figured out that I'm bi and you say this thing in class. So like, I think there's a lot of like misinformation like going on in these like classes. They're not updated um, or rather like it's not inclusive. It's not comprehensive. People don't know how to um, treat people of different uh, sexual and gender identities with respect. We don't even have the vocabulary to think about like that it's possible for people to not be straight or for people to not be, uh, you know, like uh, a girl or a boy. Yeah. 
and also other substantial uh, structural changes uh, needs to be in place to alleviate school and work stress, especially on youths or you know in society as well. Uh, I think stress, you know, to a certain extent, is good in like pushing us, but excessive stress affects our mental health. And yeah, how do we eradicate social injustices so we don't have to worry about the struggles that we might personally face or people we care about face? Um, how do we tackle the climate crisis? Because what is the world that we want to bring our children up in, right? What is the world that we want to continue living in? Do we want to live in a world where um, ice caps are melting, where heat stress is rising, uh, where the only way we could feel some sense of comfort is by sitting in an air-conditioned room that in effect affects the climate, you know? And how do we enable free speech and civil society participation that could allow youths to share what they are thinking about and not suppress their, um, the ideas that they have. Yeah. So I leave you with these questions. How do you envision the world that you live in? And how do you envision the world that you leave behind? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.